Tonight's talk is based on a, a homily by uh, Abba Dorothea's of Gaza. It's called Building Up of the Soul. Um, he uses the... Uh, it's all about spiritual metaphors. That means that he's describing something in some poetic language. And um, sometimes we can understand it, and I think often we can't. But uh, we will understand it if we, if we want to, because this is not an intellectual exercise, it's a part of faith. So one should always pray to Abba Dorothea's um, before you read him, and whatever language you want to read him in, and you know, pray for enlightenment. He's talking about building up the soul, um, building up the soul with virtues. And this, um, he used the analogy of the um, decree by Pharaoh to kill all the male-born children of the Hebrews. And so this decree went out through, through uh, Egypt that the, the children were to be killed, the babies, male, but not female. And he says that the, uh, because of this, the midwives, they, because they feared God, they created households. I'm not quite sure I understand how this relates, but this is what he says. And he says, but the, the households are not material, they're spiritual. And so he uses this some spiritual metaphor to describe how we build the soul. So we build households spiritually. And as I say, I'm not sure I really understand it myself, but maybe you have some, you know, we can discuss this. Acquiring virtues. We cannot acquire, it is not right to acquire one virtue at a time. That would seem very reasonable. But in fact, we have to acquire many virtues at the same time. And he uh, compares it with building a house. Now those of you, I know here have had experience of building, at least you know how a house is built, um, that you have to, when you're putting up the walls of a house, you have to put up four walls. You can't put up one wall and concentrate on that and make it beautiful because it's likely to collapse. It can't, it can't survive, and you certainly can't put a roof on a house with only one wall. I know this is common sense, but this is very, uh, this is a metaphor for spiritual life, for building up the virtues. And I've got a quote here from Saint John the Short or John the Dwarf, a desert father, who says, "I desire that a man take a little from all the virtues." Like building a house, you have to have all the things ready. They go up simultaneously, so everything is symmetrical. The wall has to be at a certain height, and they have to be built at the same time. So he says, I desire that a man take a little from all the virtues. For example, patience, endurance of afflictions, peace, not repaying evil for evil. If you take just one virtue, it's like, like a house, like a wall of a house, it's likely to collapse. And you won't be able to keep it, you'll lose it. Now we cannot, um, the foundation, before you build a house, you have to have a foundation. And, in, and certainly in the times of uh, Abba Dorothy is talking, he's not talking about cement, there wasn't any cement. So foundation of a house will be laying stones, different stones, all the same size, and obviously cut to fit. And that foundation is faith. Because without faith, we can't do anything. That's the foundation, is faith. We believe, and then we, we learn as we go along. And as I said to you many times, sometimes if you're coming, if you're a convert, uh, from a Protestant background, um, there's certain things that you may not be able to accept in orthodoxy. And so with faith, you have to say, I don't understand, but you wait to be enlightened later. In other words, we don't reject things because we don't understand them. Faith also is a gift from God. Though we sometimes think it depends on us whether I have faith. Well, it's actually God-given. And if we respond to the gift that God gives us, then our faith will grow. So we need to put down stones to build a house. And so in the spiritual house that we're building of our soul, we have to lay stones. One is a stone of obedience. 
Another one is the stone of long suffering. A stone of self-control. A stone of sympathy. To have sympathy is a virtue. Cutting off of the will, meekness, patience and stalwartness. These are the patience and stalwartness. Um, I can't. It's uh, yeah, Markant and Rosli. Rosli, stalwartness, being strong and steady. Strong. Markant. Rosli. Well, I looked this up in dictionaries. That game doesn't matter. <laughs> to put the stones together, because <coughs> you can't just lay them there. You have to have you know filling the cracks. You have to have mortar, and that mortar is humility. I've jumped. Sorry. If we uh, sorry. Yes. Okay. That's right. Um, and then we have to have what they call lintels. Do you know what lintels are in building a house? That's the frame around the door, not the wooden frame, but stone, bricks, and sometimes across the top. It's called a lintel, and that is the virtue of discretion. There's no good having patience if you have no discretion, because you don't know what to do with it. Long suffering, well, maybe that, that's a much wider virtue. I, I, I can't really comment on that. And the roof, what's the roof? This is the final thing on top of it, of the house. What do you think that is as a virtue, as a metaphor? Love, love. love yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Absolutely, yeah. And it says that the, that the roof um, is usually uh, finished off with a parapet, which is a little wall around the roof. And I think he's probably referring, I think, to flat roofs in the, in the Middle East. People used to sleep on the roof in, in the hot sun. I actually saw them sleeping on the roof in Jerusalem once when I was there. Um, is it so hot you sleep on top of your house? And so you put a parapet, a little wall, all the way around so people can't fall off. And this is actually biblical. I've got a quote here from Deuteronomy, which says, When you build a house, you must make a battlement, in other words, a parapet for the roof, that you do not bring blood upon your house, because somebody may fall from it. So there's a rule in the Bible. You have to have a parapet on your house. Mind you, you've got a sloping roof. It's not much value, really. So, and he says that people who fall from the roof, the metaphor, the spiritual metaphor, is our thoughts, our good thoughts. We have to prevent them from falling. So, and what is the parapet then that stops us? It's humility. So the house is built, and is it, is there, is there something missing? Yes, a skilled house builder, because there's no good trying to build a house if you don't have any skills. I mean, somebody can put up a house and it's probably crooked or falls down after a while. I, I know some horror stories about things like that, uh, people not skilled but building somebody's house for them. Um, so you need, you need to have somebody who is skilled in the spiritual life. It's what he calls, and I'm not sure whether I really understand it myself, it's called the fullness of understanding or acute self-awareness. So we can't acquire virtues without full knowledge. Then we'd like to com comment on that. What does it mean to you to have full knowledge? Somebody who is more spiritual, um, can be too. Spiritual yes, I think in the, in the sense that what it is, is that the fullness of knowledge is knowing what you're doing, basically, oh. knowing and being aware of yourself and that if you're practicing patience, you know that you're doing it. Yeah. And not just do it because that's what somebody says you should be. You could be, you know, impatient inside you, but you're trying to practice to be impatient. You have to have full knowledge, otherwise it doesn't work. It says, acquiring the virtues without 
foreknowledge is like laying a stone down and then removing it. Yeah. So you, you're, you're being patient and then you're losing it, or you're, um, you're being long-suffering, I think that's more, more uh, appropriate, you, and then you give up. So you remove the stone. A person, so, so he gives an example here, a person insults you, yes, you remain silent and forgive him in your heart. You even make, make a physical prostration. Okay, that's laying a stone. In fact, it's laying two stones. One is being silent, not complaining. The second <coughs> one is, is, is forgiveness. So you put down two stones. But you meet somebody that you know and you say, well, by the way, this person insulted me, etc., etc. Called gossip. <laughs> and you've lost two stones. I think it's like one of these uh, computer games, you know. <laughs> you, lose, you lose score, start losing what you're trying to build. You add a stone and then you go to another and complain about it. So you laid a stone of forgiveness and took two away. Okay, how do we do prostrations with full knowledge? With the understanding of this idea of full knowledge. How do we do prostrations with full knowledge? Repeatedly. Hmm? Repeatedly. Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> to do prostration with foreknowledge is actually to do it and really mean that you are making a prostration and not just as a, a, a symbol of forgiveness. Now we have Forgiveness Sunday coming up in a couple of weeks and, and of course we ask everybody f for forgiveness and it is a ritual. But it would be very nice if we actually felt forgiveness inside. I'm not saying you don't, that people don't, but if you have a lot of people in the church, um, sometimes it's just, you're doing it because that's what you do. I mean, doing it is good. I, I mean, I mean, this is, this is a wonderful thing. I mean, people are very impressed to see it for the first time. Um, but we should be doing it from our heart as well, as doing the, the physical prostration. How do we keep silence with full knowledge? We keep silence by actually believing that we should be quiet and not it's not for us to speak or comment on something. I think that's very hard, very hard. We can keep silent, but the brain is not silent, the thoughts are not silent, um, there's not any there's lack of humility there. Now I've made a note here about pious behaviour in church. Um, sometimes our behaviour in church is um, Though it's pious, it's, it is uh, without humility. Um, I'm talking about just being in church, lighting candles, praying, lining up for communion. Can sometimes be, I think, sometimes in silence that we not, no, don't notice it. Is actually a little bit of um, napakas showing um, a form of piety. Now this is very, very fine, fine line here, but whether we, we're doing it um, genuinely or whether we're doing it because that's what we're meant to do. It's not as easy as that, it's not black and white. It's, it's Maybe there's something inside us that's sort of, well, I like to, to do this in public. It applies to a priest especially because of all the things that I have to do. How do you do it with humility? How do you kiss an icon, light a candle with humility? How does a priest serve with humility? Things that we, these are the things we have to consider. I don't know the answer because it depends on each person. Abba Moses, I've got a quote here, Abba Moses um, in Egypt considered himself of no worth, genuinely. In fact, he called himself a black man and had no, who, why, why are you black man talking to himself? Uh, are you mixing with white people who are far superior than you? Good racist comment that. <laughs> um, but he believed it. Do we believe that we're, we're, we're less than somebody else? No. But we should. And my personal experience of, of an amazing man, which I, I remember all the time, um, his name, he was on the Holy Mountain, I was. Um, at the near Skeeti, which is like a village with little cells where monks live, two or three together. The one that I was staying at had five monks. 
And I went into the village and I walked and I saw this monk um, pressing grapes. And there were a lot of flies and uh, hornets. And I asked him his name and he said, my name is um, Athanasius Amatolos. And Stasi Kreshnik. Perkutus. And he said it genuinely and it yes. struck me. Yes. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm Athanasius the Sinner. That's his name. It wasn't affected. It wasn't a form of piety. It was genuine. I've never forgotten that. I, I, I think about it. And then later that evening, I went to the vigil in the, in the, the church, and all the monks came from the skeet, and he was one of the priests serving. He had something going for himself. He was in the world of the spirit. And so his answer was very genuine. It wasn't, uh, you know, um, some sort of false piety. So here's some examples of full knowledge. This is when we serve others. This actually is the, the best, the safest way to grow virtues, actually, the most important, is to serve others. This is where we can acquire virtues. It says, he who serves with full knowledge does so because he has already acquired sympathy and a merciful disposition. Do we help somebody because we want praise? Do we help somebody because we want a reward? Or do we help somebody because we can't help it? It's in our nature to be helpful, to have sympathy for people. And it says, he who serves with full knowledge is liberated from passions and spiritual battles. So if you're fighting um, some battle, spiritual battle, the cure, or the answer, is to, is to serve others. That can be in many ways, not, not necessarily serving people who are sick, but just being aware of people. Uh, even saying a good word to somebody is actually serving them. And there's an example here from the death of fathers, a brother who was struggling with indecent desire, but who with true knowledge cared for a sick man, was set free from this warfare. Start concentrating on other people away from self. You are delivered from this spiritual warfare. Delivered. And I have a quote here from Evagrius which says, Nothing so completely extinguish the passions as showing mercy to others. Nothing so completely extinguishes the passions in us as showing mercy to others. So we need to become skilled builders. And there is no virtue that is beyond us. No virtue that is beyond us. Because we have God to help us, we accept God's help. If we don't accept God's help, it's because we are lazy. It says he is slothful. So no virtue is beyond us. Everything comes from God, but what we have to do is to show interest and intention. Namarenia. This is important. It doesn't matter how weak we are in our faith, if we have the intention that is right, God will honor that. And it is said, the fathers say, that God judges us by our intentions, not by our deeds. And I discovered that, that was a great relief, suddenly so realized this is it's to do with intentions. Of course these things will be fulfilled, but they're fulfilled by God. The moment we think, well I will do this, and I will do that, and I will change this, and I will change that, pride. And God resists the proud, and so we fail. We have to learn to let go and, and trust that God can help us and say, I want to do this thing, I'm weak, I can't do it, but I want to do it. And have that desire and God can work on that desire to, for you to acquire whatever it is you want to acquire as a virtue. Another example of humility was uh, Saint Ignati Briancheninov, um, who I talked to about before. When he was a novice, as a young novice, um, he was in the monastery, his first obedience was to go to work in the bakery. Now, as you might probably know, that he was an aristocrat, and the baker was an ex-serf, a former serf, and obviously there must have been some sort of 
feel bad feeling there. So he said to um, Ignati, I don't know what his name was at that time, he said, go and get flour. And he, he threw a sack at him, and it still had flour in it, so he was covered in flour. He said nothing. He went to the where the store was, and he was told, when you go there, you have to hold the bag open with two hands, then use your teeth to hold it up to the whatever it is, you know, to contain the hopper. He did all this. But now he says himself, I did this, and I had this feeling in my heart I've never felt in my life before. A beautiful feeling of happiness of doing this. Obedience. Long-suffering being insulted and the reward was this spiritual feeling of joy and happiness. This is something we have to think about and to acquire when we're mixing with people. Do we get that feeling of joy because we have not responded to an insult? We've been silent because of humility, not silent because we don't want to speak. There was a, a monk who was very silent in the monastery and one of the elders noticed this and very quiet, didn't say anything, people insulted him, he ignored it. And uh, he, but he wasn't happy about him doing it. So he said to him, come tell me about it. He says, well, what, what, what do you think when people insult you? He says, I don't take any notice of them, they're not even worth bothering with. Lost that one. Finally, St. Abhidhara says, says that um, it's like there's a ladder to heaven I mean, this is a metaphor, okay, not a rule. A ladder to heaven, and a, up there, going up to heaven, and there's a ladder going down to hell, to Hades. He said, you can't leap from the ground up to the top run of that ladder. It's impossible. But he says, it's very easy to, to well, he said, what we should do, not try to take the other ladder and go down into Hades. But to go up, you can't just jump to the top. It takes time for each step and the virtues. And he says, try not at least to go down the ladder, the ladder's going down. Uh, do no evil to your neighbour. Don't gossip. Don't insult others. In this way you will gradually show benevolence, comforting a person with a good word. This is very important, a good word to support somebody. And suffering along with him. By this, you will begin to ascend step by step, for in helping others, we help ourselves. <laughs>